Welcome to the Digital New Life Presents podcast live at South Star. Thank you. Got Tony and Michelle here. How did the panel go? I think it was good. It's it's funny. It's a surprisingly constrained amount of time yeah. to um, get through things and cycle through four different perspectives as well. Yeah, I think the panel was great. It was a good kind of celebration of, of why Adelaide and... Mm. And how you can build global companies from this from this state, from South Australia, um, and a bit of a frank view of some of the things that we're perhaps not doing quite so well. You mentioned that maybe not all the warts came out during the chat, but oh god, no. <laughs> we didn't have enough then. time for that. <laughs> no. um, we've been talking to a, a few um, international uh, speakers this morning, but I mean, it's really interesting seeing their perspective on you know what we have here, and you know when outsiders. I, I, I went overseas and came back um, for a number of years, but you come back and you, you, it really is, you know, both from you know, living in SA but working here as well. It's, it's a great mm. space we have. But why, why did you come back? Um, I'll turn around on you. Yeah, sure, that's fine. So um, I, I met my now wife over there. So she's from the States originally and been yeah. in London for 15 years. Um, and I was quite enjoying London, to be honest. I, I, you know, I thought I would come back eventually, but I, it wasn't on the cards. But then we came back for a wedding with her um, and we were here for a week and did... Yorks and down the McLaren Vale, and she was just like, "Why are we? Why London? did you leave? What? What? What are you doing? Like, let's yeah. let's go now. Let's go. Let's go. And, 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 and she loves it. And I think that's probably similar to why everybody's here. That you know, there are a bunch of indigenous entrepreneurs here in South Australia who who, who are here for those reasons. We've probably all travelled. I'm not sure if you've travelled, but I've certainly travelled. And you go away and you spend a bit of time away and you get some perspective and, yeah. and you realise that what you've got here is actually really special and something worth coming back and, and then you need to work to make it give you what you want. That's right. You know, you're, you're sort of having to create the industry because if you're sitting around and you're waiting for that opportunity, it isn't going to appear. You have to go and create the opportunity. And that's some of the chats we've been having this morning around, I feel like uh, in this space, in the, in the startup space, there's often been a bit of a reliance on, on government and, and sort of looking to other people to, to either look for funding or you know, support, whereas I think really we sort of just need, we have to do it, right? That's, that's right. That's where it starts. Yeah, and, and, and taking responsibility for, for your own destiny. Yeah, 100%. But I think there are sort of all the components of the ecosystem are important parts, mm. you know, so we need to... We need to understand the role of government in supporting kind of new startups and yeah, innovation, sure. particularly when you're developing a new industry. And we've got kind of this prime position at the moment in this state for a high tech industry, for digital kind of technologies that you can scale to the world from here yep. that don't require kind of large corporate customer bases. Um, and it, some of those technologies require some nurturing and some of that comes from government, some of it comes from private capital, some of it comes from kind of customers within the state being test sites for new technologies. But it's kind of all of those component parts that need to need to come together. Mm. But people were talking before, Lewis was talking about the needing sort of a beacon, I don't know actually it was Alex from a, a Startup Australia, but needing sort of a beacon or, or some sort of putting the flag in the ground and saying well, did, either a precinct like Law 14 or, or you know, an industry that actually can start growing so that people can actually look in and say, well, look at this stuff that's happening mm. you know, in Adelaide and actually attracting, I mean, we were talking about talent just before, how do we attract talent in? Because um, I mean, one of the things that I face in Adelaide is, is finding is finding you know talent that hasn't hasn't left and gone to Sydney or Melbourne or, or mm. overseas. But if you if you have lots of little cool things going on mm. independently, it doesn't create such a wave of change. Yeah, I sure. think if you have sort of collective intent, like with the Lot 14 site, yep. um, it's far more substantive and it's big thinking and it's that's what's attractive to talent kind of coming back to the state because it's this it's this big kind of um, collective run towards generating these new you know this new wave of technology or innovation within our state, which is awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Mm. Um, Going back to, I suppose, some of those warts, and both of you, you know, having been involved in businesses in SA for, for a long time, what have been some of the you know, historical kind of roadblocks, and, and what's changed, do you think, in the last decade or so? Uh, I think for us, the roadblocks are talent and capital. Okay. Um, and we've, they're all things where we've been a long way from our market, we've been a long way from traditional um, sources of labour, we're a long way from our clients, and so we've had to create the universe of how to connect um, where we are now to be able to execute the work that we want to do from this location. And it all reverses out to this is where we want to live. Yep. What are we going to do to remove the impediments to be able to make the work we want to do happen from here? 
And so education is one of them. Talent flow is, is a key impediment to what we do. And so we dealt with that, firstly, with the Flinders University, and then secondly, um, and currently, with the University of South Australia, where we developed okay. a curriculum. So we put resources internally to developing curriculum, right. building our own talent base. That takes years to develop the kind of talent, the volume <laughs> of talent that you need. Sure. Um, but, you know, that and I, I think capital are, pretty, are the key ones. Like 10 years ago, I would have said telecommunications, but we solved yeah. that. We, <laughs> again, started, did our own startup with some assistance from the state government, mm. which bootstrapped a, a broadband network that ultimately became a national um, broadband network that was supporting people in our space. So the need that we had was the same need that everybody else had and no one else was addressing it, so we addressed it out of here. Sure. Um, so you really just market deficiencies, and I think that going back, I think Michelle made the point in the um, in the talk. It was like the capital is shy to high risk opportunity, yes, very much so. And and we need the capital to be braver. And I think that 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 identifies a market gap or a market failure, really, where that's potentially an opportunity for government to step in and provide some leverage there, okay. um, utilizing public money to sort of de-risk some of that and encourage some of that um, private money to come over the line. You, have you seen that changing? Because I mean, that's something that I think we've noticed going back five or six years working with some of the startups in our business. I mean, they were one struggling to even have conversations with with investors um, from the get go. But then two, you know, very risk averse um, investors, and and they're not really to look into um, investing into sort of tech startups or um, anything that had that kind of uh, high risk factor. No, I think it's um. That I think it has changed. Mm. So we had a. I started my first company ten years ago. And two of the biggest challenges were um, were capital, lack of capital, and culture. Okay. Um, culture around risk aversion, not yeah. wanting to mm -hmm. delve into new technologies, not wanting to uptake them in the businesses, not wanting, you know, government not wanting to leverage those technologies and use them or even try them. Um, that was kind of the biggest challenge then. I think that's changed significantly. Um, but on the capital side, I think there's still that real traditionalist kind of capital in the market that's very risk averse. There's a lot of conversations that we've had saying, love the team, love the business, love the technology, amazing market, mm. um, great opportunity, come see us when you're at revenue. <laughs> and it's like, well, I mean, that's fantastic, but it'll yeah. be dead before then, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah, sure. there's got to be a recognition that that these businesses need help to get to that success state. And if you do help them, they will give back tenfold to the ecosystem. Yeah, that's so right. So it's kind of like this full cyclical um, thing that happens that, you know, if you help develop the success of those companies, they will give back to the ecosystem to further the success of new, the next generation of companies. And that's how a mature ecosystem kind of builds, um, yeah. And then it's sort of self-sustaining off the back of that Correct. as well, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're both in obviously quite different mm. different areas, and I think Michelle, sort of the, the field that you're in with, with AI and, and sort of merging with medical, the, the the future of that is so interesting and so exciting. What are some of the things that you're looking forward instead of ten years? What what some of the where do you see the the future of your industry going? Oh, I mean, AI is the medical and healthcare sector is completely ripe for AI mm. um, at the moment. So we've got this situation where we've got aging populations globally. We've got diminishing workforces. Um, there's going to need to be AI embedded in pretty much every industry as we know it. But some of the current AI techniques like what we use, the deep learning and computer vision, are really perfectly suited to diagnostic applications, yep. to, you know, trawling through large amounts of genetic code to, you know, make better decisions around how to treat different patients um, or how they'll respond to different treatments. There's just such an amazing plethora of application areas where it can impact. That's really exciting, especially sort of early, you know, early diagnostics and, um, you know, it's, it's incredible, I think. And then looking forward, yeah. and I suppose, into, um, you know, where that goes in terms of, you know, Simple stuff like health tracking, now we've got these, but where it can go forward in terms of, you know, in, in, internally um, having systems in place so we can, you know, really track our health and, and diagnosis Correct. going forward. Yeah. Um, did you ever think, Tony, of, of taking the business out of SA? It's, it's an interesting point because in the very early days when we were maybe 20 or 30 people, we had a range of people come through, typically from Sydney, um, who would come through and say, why are you here? Yeah. And and we were pretty dogged because we were a pretty dogged, stupid bunch of people, really. <laughs> like we, were, we were pretty dug into this idea. This is why you know, we were doing it to be here. Yeah. Um, and they would come through and they say, you have no right to be here. You, 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 know, this, okay. you will fail. And that happened. And it's probably just dialed up our tenaciousness <laughs> along the way. Um, 
I think had we tried to do this in a landscape like Sydney or Melbourne, we would have failed because the competitive tension for labour um, and attention was just so much stronger there. We, we had a first mover advantage really in the space that we're in where there are really only three companies in Australia that were doing it and there are a handful of companies globally that were doing the kind of work that we were aspiring to. Sure. But I don't think we could have got it off the ground in Sydney. I think there's a unique advantage here in South Australia where the pond is small enough that you can get your head above the water and get noticed. Um, where the landscape is pretty proud of what people achieve here and so it gets behind you. Not so much in the capital sense, but just in a yeah. sort of genial long sense. And I think we couldn't have done it in somewhere like Los Angeles because really we built a business about doing it not in Los Angeles. And we had this seven hour time difference where they talked to us at the end of their day and give us a set of notes on things that we were showing them and the next morning they would have them on their desk. Nice. And that was the original value proposition to working with that market, which mm. was that um, we could turn stuff around overnight and it, worked, it was very efficient for them. So, I, you know, I don't think we could have done it in Sydney or Melbourne. I don't think we would have, we'd have got our heads above the water. Um, and I think we would have just got smashed with competitive tension in other markets like commercials and broadcast that would have raided talent. Yeah, okay. I think that's an interesting opportunity that we do have here in SA, being sort of a little bit removed. That we, mm. you know, the, the Far enough, but not too far. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's amazing how big an impediment it is to take two flights to get to Los Angeles. The, the, you know, <laughs> a few people who want to come here because you've got to change planes in Sydney and Melbourne, it's just normal. <laughs> that's right. You just got to get used to that. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, and you've worked on some pretty exciting stuff. I think it's really interesting that, you know, when you started, that this the connectivity that we have now, you know, wasn't really there. And I've, I've heard about your sort of bandwidth issues in the past, but mm. um, you know, I think taking that on your own and actually going out and, and finding solutions um, is what needs to happen. Mm. You touched on university. Um, I feel like there's you know changes that need to happen on a tertiary level to sort of start equipping people for for the future and coming out into the workforce. And um, not only I suppose from a from a technical viewpoint, but also just the way I suppose we think and, and, and being able to have that agile kind of mindset and not knowing what, you know, in 10 years time, what, what professions you might be walking into, mm. but being quick enough on your feet to sort of run with those punches. Well, that's the thing. I, I've been, I've been writing, um, strangely, I'm having this Banksy Park High School moment yeah. today <laughs> and yesterday because tonight I'm doing this speech at the valedictory thing for the school oh, nice. and I haven't been back there since I graduated wow. in 1982. And... And then I just met a guy who was in my year there and I was like, wow, this is just tricky. Why is all this coming together? But I've been sort of pondering what it is, the skills that people need to have to survive in that world and agility and learning and, and, and readiness to change. They're all parts of, of this sort of um, human recipe that people need to be able to get through in this future. And I think it's, they're things that we probably already have. If you're an entrepreneurial, you need to be able to be agile, light on your feet, yep. adapt, all that kind of stuff. And they're the, the kinds of things we need to push into education at a very young age. So I, it made me very happy when the Premier announced that Banksy Park was going to be one of these schools. So I thought, wow, this is, this is weird. It's a big stalk today. <laughs> I think it does start right at that yeah. early. It, it's kind of we don't want to happen across entrepreneurs. We don't want entrepreneurs to fall into entrepreneurship. We want to kind of guide them sure. and we want to ready them and make sure that they're prepared for a world where you won't have a purist career mm. anymore, where you need to be kind of multidisciplinary and yep. and kind of very agile, as, mm. as Tony said. It's really important to kind of engender that that um, agility in at the school age level. And I don't think it's about necessarily kind of getting more kids coding or even kind of upskilling them in terms of STEM. It's just about giving them that overall understanding of the technology landscape and how it's going to change every traditionalist industry as we know it yep. and preparing them for that future future change. But, but I think also how, how do you... It's about teaching kids to take control of their destiny. I, I think a lot of what society looks like today is people jumping on somebody else's bus. Yep. You know, As workers, we train people to go and learn something and get on the bus that somebody's pointing. Yep. And, and, and my bus analogy, I keep wheeling it out, but... I sort of feel like we need to be teaching people how to sit in the driver's seat and take charge of their destiny yeah. and how or, they're going to sort of point the bus in the right direction build, instead or, of or being build a the bus, create, create or, a new or build bus. the bus in the first yeah. place. But how are you going to take control of your journey as a person? You and think, that's a skill, I think, which is, which is interesting. I interestingly learned that at school. You think back to high school and it was very much, you know, you, 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 do, you do a test and it's like, well, you, you'll be good at journalism or you'll be good mm. at law and it mm. sort of points you in these directions and you're sort of always sort of pointing in that direction. And then you'll go through that and you'll come out and now that's what I, that's what I am. But it, mm. it, um, 
I think and increasingly so that's not going to be the case. But, and we bake those expectations in from like year nine where yeah, we tell yeah. people they're going to make career choices from there. You go, well, I'm a, like, I'm a 12-year-old. Yep. How do you make yeah. a career choice? Yeah, quite, quite literally, it's, you know, you must pick these subjects now or you're not going to be able to do you know, software engineering or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, one of the things we spoke about earlier was, was failure. So at a tertiary level, but even in school, right, you're sort of taught not to fail, right? So failure is a bad thing to mm. a certain extent. So actually, how do we you know, breed in that cycle, I suppose, of learning to fail and, and grow from it? I think we were talking about it before. Yeah, I think that's really important because I think South Australia traditionally has not been good at kind of um, promoting failure or at least promoting... I, I don't agree with promoting failure or accepting failure. I agree with leveraging failure to create your next success. So mm. using it as a learning experience and kind of using that to guide your next experience will inherently make you more successful as a person, which is why Silicon Valley investors will only invest in second or third time founders. Sure. Right? They don't like their first time founders because they've not experienced that kind of roller coaster. They've not experienced the failures. They've not had to get mm. up and restart again. They've not had those yeah. negative experiences that kind of shape who you are as an entrepreneur. So I think it's kind of, it's just about building in that narrative that it's okay when things don't work out and sometimes they're entirely beyond your control, but it's what you do with that learning experience that's actually critical to driving success. Yeah, I think it's not about promoting it, it's just about saying it's okay and, yep. and, it's okay. It is, yeah. and look at the great things that can come out of it. Mm. But, but Australians are also really good at cutting down people yep. who are successful mm. and, and that's something that we really have to move past because what it does is it makes failure all the more painful for somebody yep. and, and you have to be resilient to be in this business anyway but the prospect that you may have done everything humanly possible to be successful, you might have run a great business and for an external reason you know, say the dollar goes skyrocketing or sure. something like that, your business gets turned inside out and mm. fails. You're going to have the crap kicked out of you on the way through. Yeah. And why would you get back up and do it again? Americans are actually quite good at re-resuscitating mm. people who have crashed. Come on now, up you get, let's go. They kind of embrace it more, don't they? Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it's it's good don't. to have gone through you know, several different businesses. And people, you know, hear mm. people, and, you, and you feel that in business. There's a bit of a pressure on you that you, you kind of need to be going upwards and onwards all, all the time. Like, mm. um, you know, taking a step back isn't really seen as a, as a positive. Um, even though it probably is from could be from a business perspective, how how do we change that? Though? How does that change? Because it, it does seem oh, to be on time. a national level, doesn't it? It's time. Yeah. I think I think you know so many good and positive values flow through society by um, that kind of change happening at a school level. Mm. You know, we we have a young generation of of people coming out of high school now that are way more accepting of um, gender and sexuality and racial differences. Yep. Um, you know, it just takes time. I think also it's about developing a supportive community. So, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, um, you know, need to be accepting of people who have had a go and mm. for whom it has not worked yep. um, and need to kind of pick them up and give them other opportunities that might they might be better suited to or, you know, allow them to kind of re-experience and, and not cut them down with that negative narrative. And, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, invest in those founders who have had that negative experience and understand what they've learned from it as opposed to the fact that they've failed and, you know, um, haven't done what they should have done with their investment or whatever whatever the case may be. Yeah. We were talking about it in the lens of mental health before, but around, um, you know, founders, but um, people in general just not wanting to open up and, you know, talk about feelings and talk about, especially in business, you know, sort of everything sort of gets kept, oh, everything's going great, everything's great. And it, it, <laughs> It isn't. It's, it isn't. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, opening up dialogue, and that's why you know, these kind of things are great, I think, locally as well. So you can actually you know, start meeting other people, um, you know, that are doing similar things and on similar journeys and, and start having those conversations because you, know, you often do feel like you're kind of in a, in a bubble or on an island. Um, and I think that the more people, and that, that's why I think like a lot 14 is great, the more you can get people together and have those conversations, I think it's better for the ecosystem in general. Mm. Yeah, you need that diversity of thought. You mm. need that diversity of thought, diversity of experiences, um, you know, so that you can kind of leverage from each other and, and find the best best way forward. Yeah, and, and like I've been lucky. At Rising Sun, we're, I'm one of three, and so we have been, you know, we're all on the same page yeah. in a value sense. We don't always agree on things and we sure. fight about things often, but, um, you know, to... To have partners to go through that kind of process with is incredibly valuable because it is a very lonely ride. You'll have days where you're just feeling there, sitting there, feeling very sad and very lonely and, <laughs> and very exposed. 
And the opening up thing is something that we that everyone needs to do anyway. As in a leadership role, you have to be able if you want to be an authentic person and yep. you want to have something, you want to be something that people want to come along with. You have to show people your real self, and um, it's pretty challenging for people. Um, but you know, I think we do better, better than what we would have done before with that. Yeah, it's definitely improving. And I think when we're talking about sort of the younger generations coming up, I think there's mm. more of an acceptance around that as well. Yeah, um, but yeah, which trans- is really healthy. It is healthy, mm. um, yeah, on a on a human level, but then yeah, mm. definitely throws throws through the business and, and culture within business. Mm. Um, have you, in terms of how big's the team at Rising Sun now? One hundred and eighty. Nice. How, how has that been, sort of going from you know a small company through to that many people and and maintaining that, you know, I suppose as a leader that that transparency and and you know trying to let that trickle down into um, the team. I haven't had the leadership role for the whole time. I've had it sort of on and off variously throughout. Sure. Um, but it's challenging. You know, it's, it's really hard when you start at a company where everything is very personal and everyone is, is mates and you're all late noodles in the backyard at, at Kensington every Friday night because there are only 20 or 30 of you. Um, it was really very personal and you had a very personal relationships. And then the company evolves and it, it took a jump to, I think, about 100, 110 fairly quickly okay. off that and we moved to the city. And you lost contact with people and yep. all of a sudden you, you see people on the floor that you don't know and it's hard to connect meaningfully with people around that. Mm. But we have company meetings where it's pretty frank, pretty full and frank um, about disclosing information and how we're going and, okay. and encourage people to talk and ask questions and um, have a reasonably open door to that kind of conversation where people will come and talk about something, they feel passionate about something and come and put it out there. Yeah, great. Um, I think you have to encourage that kind of culture. We have a fairly standardly you know, hierarchical uh, management model sure. inside the business, but it is known that you can come and talk to one of the owners or the founders along the way if there's something really burning that you think isn't getting addressed, then just come and ask. Have you, have you experimented with sort of different models around that sort of management or if that's just how it's been? Oh, it's a, our management's a constant process yeah. of evolution. <laughs> and I think it's actually the best place that it's ever been at the moment. We've cool. got a really good structure at the moment and yeah. really good people in the role. We've got a couple of people who are studying their MBA along the way and I learned so much from the people who are studying because they bring these great new things. And I go, yeah, oh, nice. gee, I wish I knew that 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm busily, in my mind, redoing how I would do it if I did it again and it doesn't look anything like what we did. Yeah, okay. But that's, I mean, that's part of the journey, right? And you, yeah, that, yeah. That's how it has to be. Yeah, but I'm, we're in a really great phase where a lot of really fabulous new stuff is coming th- into the business in terms of ideas and ways of managing and, and ways of leading and it's it's good. We're on a really good transition. Exciting. Mm. Right. It's great we're all doing it in SA here as well. So, mm. Um, thanks so much for the chat. Really hey, appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. No worries. Cheers, guys. Thanks.